science. And we put that all together in a little diagram. Um, all the work that Keith Betteridge and other people have done using Overseer, if you add up the total emissions, uh, they're currently um, 20 uh, plus or minus 5 kilograms per hectare per year across, across the catchment. From what we can determine back in the 70s, it was about, it was about half that. Sheep and beef, it's, it's land use in the catchment has changed now with Colin Armour and most other people um, buying, buying into it. I'm not sure what the numbers are now, but when we were studying it, um, 20. Uh, Mike Stewart has shown that the mean residence time of the groundwater, and it's a groundwater dominated system, is about 40 years. Um, Roland Singer and others on the spidier side up the top of the catchment um, have shown that uh, where the waters go anoxic, uh, there is significant removal of nitrate by, by denitrification. So there are some nitrogen losses. Um, Fleur Matheson uh, has looked at uh, nitrogen removal in wetlands um, in that system uh, and found that it's not particularly significant. The wetlands are extremely old and they seem to be leaching as much nitrogen now as they're, as they're taking out. They transform it rather than, than remove it. But the really interesting thing is that down at the bottom of the catchment, we've done a, a detailed nutrient budget, and we find that what's coming out is only five plus or minus one compared to 20 um, going in. So there, what we don't know uh, is whether 20 to minus one, whether you've got 75% nitrogen loss uh, or whether uh, it's partly uh, a there's some surprises coming, coming through the system. So the losses are somewhere between 75 and 50. And I simply use this as an example of the fact that uh, the science of nutrient delivery um, is quite complicated. Now I know that to people in the front room would say I wasn't allowed to say that life is complicated. Um, but the science is, and we, we, one has to bear that in mind, I think it is possible to, to um, draw the key points out of the catchment science that we're, that we're doing and put that into a trading scheme, but I think we do have to acknowledge that there are some complexities. So we, we, we think we understand the Tutai Uapua catchment where the lake load is significantly less than the emissions because of some combination of groundwater lags and losses. That's fine for the Tutai Uapua, but there's an awful lot of other sub-catchments in Taupo that we haven't thrown gazillions of dollars of frisk um, research at. Um, and therefore, the advice um, we gave to Justine and Bill Bant and others, and I remember the discussions, they came along and said, um, can you please uh, tell us what the lag time is and the attenuation for each individual farm within the Taupo catchment, um, and defend that in the environment court. Uh, so, yeah, right. Uh, hence the decision, and we'll be talking about later, to, to just go straight to the emissions and say, if we reduce what's being emitted by the farm, from the farms by 20%, eventually uh, we'll achieve uh, uh, our goal of the lake without needing to go into all the detail of groundwater lags and nutrient attenuations. Okay, Rotorua is slightly different uh, for two reasons. First of all, we have a very good history uh, of, of land use. Um, in, in that catchment. We also have pretty good history on the groundwater lags. Some of Claude Taylor's early bomb trivia work was there and there's been a lot of work subsequently. Uh, so here's, uh, here's GNS's science. The, the, this catchment up here has about 110 year um, mean residence time to the hour, hour 61, the, the longer time, hour 15 years. So the residence time of the groundwater is well documented in, in that system. And so we thought, well, here is an opportunity to put together uh, a, a catchment model for the, for the lake. Um, we, um, we, we went to Scandinavian model for HBV, and we adapted it for, for use in New Zealand. Um, so in each of the catchments, it, it has a lot of soil stores. So it is moving some nutrient quite quickly into the system, uh, and it also has aquifers underneath, which moves some of it quite slowly into the system. And we've been able to use the Rotan model. Um, here is historic um, nutrient loads, measured, measured nutrient loads. Here are predicted annual nutrient loads uh, from 1920 until present day. And then we were able to use that model to go forward and say, well, what if we did nothing, the R0, uh, and 
that shows the, the load continuing to increase as stuff comes through the groundwater. Uh, these year-to-year -year fluctuations are associated with climate. Um, in wet years, um, a lot of nitrogen um, is leached into the groundwater. Um, in dry years, um, it, it, it just it builds up on the soil, waiting to be leached out subsequently. Uh, and here we reduce the, the, the load by 250 tonnes a year, 300 tonnes and 350 tonnes, and here's the target that, that we're aiming for. So the take-home message is you need substantial reductions. Uh, and you can play this game, it's, it's a sort of a top-down game. It's what if uh, half of the dairy farmers in the catchment um, started growing pineapples, then you could put that into the, into the model and run it, run it forward. The question is how does this um, help nutrient trading? And there is no way that a complicated model like Rotan could be built into a nutrient trading scheme. I never really would go bonkers. But what you can do is you can take some emergent properties out of the model, and here's one of them. What, what, these, um, what these lines are are contours of mean residence time. So if, if one was farming up, up, up here, then roughly it's going to take 100 years for the water to come through the ground, through the groundwater. The nutrients that get into the groundwater are going to take about, about 100 years um, to, to reach the lake um, if you're down in here. 20 years. Um, and so on the basis of a map like this, um, the thought was, and Susie Kerr's idea, well why don't we trade vintages? In other words, here's, here's our cap, this is the, the, the shrinking cap that Hugh talked about, which says that in the year 2030 we want 650 tonnes of nitrogen to be reaching the lake. Eventually we want 435 tonnes of nitrogen to be reaching the lake. So we have, we have this cap over time. So what we do is that we generate 650 um, coins, date stamped 2030, and we trade them. Susie said trading's easy once you've decided what you want to do. Ditto, in 2050, uh, we want 600, uh, whatever it is, 618 tons a year. So the, the, the mint um, that generates uh, 618 day stamped um, 2050. So how do we use them? You have to work, you have to know which groundwater lag zone you're in. So if I'm farming in this in a 50 year lag zone, then in order to do something in the year 2000, I need to have enough of these coins, date stamped 2050, to match my emissions for, for, from, from that year. Uh, and one can buy and sell uh, those vintages, realizing that people of different lag zones will be interested in buying, buying different ones. So in summary, and I think we'll probably be hearing some more about, about this scheme later, um, in summary, what the science has sort of said is that uh, in Tampo, uh, there were so many unknowns about groundwater lags and attenuation uh, that the decision to reduce emissions without worrying about groundwater lags was the sensible decision to make on the basis of the science that was there. Uh, in Rotorua, the, the late target had been set at 400. 35 tonnes a year, but in, in order to relate that back uh, to what was going on from the farms, one needed to do some sophisticated catchment science, which we did as a, a thought a thought experiment. And people will talk about that uh, some more. And so one of the possibilities was that you would trade date stamped uh, emissions. Uh, and the, the real question is, uh, was that additional complexity worth it? but I'll leave that question for others to answer.